Mama Chandra, great quarterback, John Halo to his new favorite wide receiver, St. Peter, and touchdown for the Pearly Gators. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week will be the final sports cast for the season as we make way for the holiday season. I wish you all happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Be safe, celebrate with your family and friends, have great times. Uh, this week, unfortunately, we had two passings of two great players from when I was growing up. John Hadle and Gaylord Purry. And this show will be dedicated to a number of cartoons, and hopefully some great little insights and stats and anecdotes. I also want to touch on the college football, uh, the playoffs, which uh, occurred Friday and yesterday. And as I'm going into tape, we still don't know what for. Well, we shouldn't say what for, but the likelihood of obviously it's going to be Georgia and Michigan 1-2. I don't think Georgia is going to move off that number one post. And Michigan really just solidified their spot as the number two team in the nation. And three and four is going to be interesting with TCU, Ohio State, Alabama, maybe even Tennessee, all claiming to have a shot in there. And we'll get into all of uh, the elements that are going into those final four. And TCU may have just had a Heisman Trophy moment for their quarterback, a tough player, Max Dugan. Uh, And that was a classic yesterday. That was, without a doubt, the best game of the four uh, to determine who was going to be in the final four uh, of uh, of the whole weekend. That K-State TCU game, I was on pins and needles, and I I really am not a fan of either team. Root for Notre Dame, root for Army, all that. I do like TCU, though, this year because – of they got a great story. They have a heck of a story in quarterback Max Dugan. Plus, they've they've done it with basically mirrors uh, coming back. As one uh, writer called them, comeback kids, cardiac kids, because they've had so many second half uh, come from behind victories. And it would be kind of a shame if they didn't qualify losing on fourth and inches, and we'll talk about that in in a couple of minutes. But John Hadle, I would like to talk about. Now, Hadle is not in the Hall of Fame. And I guess this is my one push uh, for the Hall of Fame for John Hadle. And real quick, he is an interesting guy. First of all, I've never seen another player in any sport with the last name of Hadle. I always thought it was cool. First of all, I could always, I always, I always thought he was missing a vowel, H A D L. Uh, number two was how could you not like the Chargers growing up? They had, without a doubt, probably. I bet you that if you asked AFL fans who had the coolest uniforms, maybe not the helmets because everyone has a different one on that, but everyone would say, "I love the powder blue." I'll put that up here instead of my mug. The powder blue with the lightning bolts on the jerseys. And the yellow pants or the gold pants with the white lightning bolt going down uh, the side. And then their helmets were white. So they really stood out with the lightning bolt going across and the player's number on his jersey, also on his helmet. It was really cool. And the one who always stood out for me, besides Hadle, was, of course, Lance Allworth, number 19. And as a kid, you remember if, if you grew up in the 60s, and I know Howard and I did, my esteemed producer and and great advisor and mentor. <laughs> but if you grew up, you used to be Channel 4. Uh, and I, I just always remember watching the late games. And the Jets would always be on the road because that's how you would see it if it was out in California. So they were either playing Oakland, maybe Kansas City, the late start. But I do remember the, the games in San Diego. Now, they did start in L.A. first then moved to San Diego, and of course, now they've moved back to L.A. Didn't know this about the Chargers. Uh, In the first six years, they played in five championship games and won only one of them. But that wasn't behind uh, John Hadel. It was actually behind Tobin Rote, who was a cousin of Kyle Rote. This is what I love about this show, because 
when Howard gives me ideas or something transpires during the week, I love doing research. But this really gets me to get into the nuts and bolts about certain teams and their histories. And I never realized Tobin wrote. You got to remember, uh, I grew up in the late 60s really watching football. And Hadel and this company, when they were really successful, the Chargers were in the early 60s. The funny thing about these Charger teams, do you realize they played every year, it seemed, they were playing ties. Top by, and I did do a show on ties, top by that 1970 year. Ready for this? They were five, six, and three. They had three ties that year uh, behind Hadel. Hadel could do one thing. Maybe uh, later on, he wasn't part of championship teams, but for some way, somehow, he led the Chargers to ties. In fact, ready for this, the Chargers uh, in 62-4, 10-1. Then they were 11-3 under Gilman, Sid Gilman, who was uh, the mentor for. And now here's why I would love to see uh, John Hadel as uh, a Hall of Famer, because he embodied what the AFL was. They just threw the ball. Now, he had a high interception rate to uh, touchdown rate, but does lead the league uh, a number of times in completions and in touchdown passes. Yeah, he does lead in interceptions. But you got to remember this. The rules for passing today have been so liberalized to really uh, make use of the high scoring, what fans want to see. Years ago, defensive backs did everything they could to prevent a guy from catching a ball. You think it's bad today with these pass interferences where the guy is hugging them. I mean, years ago, they would just take their, their fists or their forearms and just, you know, ram it down their throats, so to speak. Holding, uh, today you can only hold, you know, first five yards, then you got to let go of the guy. Back then, it was just crazy with what they used to do to these players and how they could hit uh, for the safety of the of the players. And, of course, uh, you don't want them getting injured. The game, and I'm not laughing at that as much as I just think of how brutal the sport used to be. Um, and really, the game has had to c come down because these guys are just simply so big. In fact, looking at... Hadel's vital statistics, and this is what I love also about these trading cards, which is what I love. He was only 6'1", 205. Now, there are some football players, indeed, today who are 6'1", 205, but generally today, because so many linemen are monsters, you know, 6'5", 6'6", and they're 280. They can bench press 1,000 pounds. Um, the players, the quarterbacks, have to be bigger, too. And Hadel would have survived today. Don't misunderstand me. I think he would have been a quarterback in the NFL today. But he would not be, quote, unquote, the computer printout. I think today it's 6'3", 6'4", and they want you to be about 230, 235. So you can handle not just, uh, just the little knocks of the game, but also just the sacks and just the late, you know, just the hits on, on the human body are just boom. So rough with today's players. But anyway, getting back to Hadel. So they were 8-5-1 and one under Hadel. Then they go 9-2-3 and three under Hadel. Then they are 7-6-1. and one. They have six ties in the first three years. Then they're 8-5-1 and one in 67. Oh, lo and behold, 1968, they go 9-5. And, and uh, wow, on that team, ready for this? One of their notables was Chuck Weber, defensive backfield coach, and Bum Phillips, who would go on and coach one of my teams, the Houston Oilers. And um, in 69, there were eight and six, but here's the one. 1970, under coach Charlie Waller, they were five, six, and three. So one thing Hadel could do, and that was lead the Chargers at least to a tie. Yes, he does lead them to a couple of championship games. He is on one championship game. Uh, he was okay when he did get the shot. The one year he does play, he does mop-up duty to Tobin Rote when they beat the Boston Patriots 51-10. But I just wanted to show you the back of the card, and, and this is why collectors so uh, love you know, grabbing all these old cards and why, if you were a kid, why you were so enthusiastically running down to uh, 
the comic book store or the candy store or the five and dime to pick up your ba baseball or football cards because they were chock full of interesting stuff. Aside from, you know, the picture of the football player, and of course I have the little one of John Hadle there, they had a little story and they also had, and this is what I used to love, the cartoons. But on this one, it was a cartoon basically with a trivia question. And it said, who is the watch charm guard? And that is in quotations, the watch, like a, a wristwatch. And of course, you can see all the, all the clocks in the back, the watch charm guard. Well, I didn't know this. And it was, uh, that was the nickname for the shortest football guard on your offensive line. All right. And this is what they said. This is a 64 card of John Hadle. And uh, ready for this? In his year of 1963, Hadle was 28 and 65, 28 completions and 65 attempts for a 43 completion rate and six touchdowns. Overall, he was 135 and 325, 41.5 with 21 touchdowns. Now, he finished over 50%. So you know that he was a very valuable player to those Chargers teams. In fact, this is what they said. He was really the backup quarterback to Tobin Rote, who had been in the NFL, gone to the CFL, and then signed with the Chargers, and was in the later stages, obviously, in his career, 34, 35, 36, when he was with the Chargers. And then it says here, though, overshadowed by veteran quarterback Tobin Rote in 1963, yes, and he is related to Kyle, I believe they were cousins. John is still considered one of the game's most prominent youngsters. In 62, he threw 15 touchdown passes and picked up 163 yards through the airwaves. <laughs> through the airwaves, like it's a radio show. Uh, a runner-up for Rookie of the Year honors in 62, John is being groomed for a future role as full-time quarterback. He was the MVP in his college All-Star game. Now, he does go to the University of Kansas. When I was a kid, uh, Kansas stunk in football. They were just fodder for Oklahoma and Nebraska every week in the Big Eight. And it wasn't a matter of how many points they were going to surrender, 45, 50. It was really a matter of how many points the third-team offense for Nebraska or the Sooners was going to score against the Jayhawks or the Wildcats defense, respectively, because they were just terrible. Under John Hadle, though, they had success. They actually won back-to-back -back years with seven wins. They were one and one against top 10 teams. And in Hadel's last year, he gets a win in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. I do believe that they defeated uh, in 61 Rice uh, in the uh, Blue Bonnet Bowl, which was staged on December 16th, 1961. Actually, they hammered them. Uh, remember, Rice used to be in the Southwest Conference. They beat them 33 to 7 in that game. And, of course, that was engineered by uh, John Hadle. He goes on to the AFL and is plays back up until Gilman, the coach there, and really a, a offensive whiz because he does bring the passing game in, much like Don Coriel does later on to the Chargers with Dan Fouts and the Coriel uh, Air Corps. Uh, but he sits, pines on the bench, does get some, Experience in the games, backing up Tobin Rote, does win a championship. Uh, and really, that Charger team under Gilman, San Diego franchise, was very good. Five of the first six years, in fact, of the AFL, they do play in the championship game. They win only one. All right. That's segue now. Well, let's do the college football playoffs before I do anything else. And by the way, you know, I am going to say this. Hadle, and this is my I, I, my editorial on why I think Hadle should be in there. First of all, uh, love the number 21. You can't find any other quarterbacks with 21 today. That's not why I love him so much, although it is unique uh, to all things quarterbacks in the NFL today. But here's why I think Hadle should be in the Hall of Fame. One is he embodied everything that the AFL was about prior to the merger. They threw tons of time. Uh, he did lead the Chargers. He had a winning percentage over 500 for the Chargers. 
They were competitive during his years. He has 15 comeback wins. I was looking at this on football reference. but And I'm not making this argument, but he does have a higher, and I don't know how they figure it out, but I'm just using the numbers here. He has a higher quarterback rating than Joe Namath, who is in the Hall of Fame. Now, we know why Joe is in there. Put it, if Had Joe not been hurt, there's no question he would have been a greater quarterback. But for what he did, and I would say that probably 50% of the fact Joe is in the Hall of Fame is because of Super Bowl three and the guarantee. I think guaranteeing it and winning really put Joe Namath in an elite group of quarterbacks. Statistically, okay. Everyone is going to kill him on the number of interceptions and all the rest of it. But he was hurt quite a bit and injured. But when he was healthy, he was a great quarterback. Yes, I know. He threw a lot of interceptions. We've all talked about that. Hadel is the same way in this respect. I think he was a really good quarterback. But he is starting to lead a team that is kind of progressing to being over the hill. And people don't remember this, but he is in a division where the Raiders are becoming the dynasty in the AFL and the AFC, more so than Kansas City. I know that Kansas City had some good teams, but when you think about it, it was really, when you th when you think about a team that was a dynasty, it's the Raiders, when really Davis th takes control of that team and becomes the general manager. And that whole win, baby, win. And uh, the Raider Nation just takes control of the AFL West because they were in championships in 69. Uh, there, I mean, they were in playoffs, as, as I said, every year from like 68 on. And of course, they win uh, two Super Bowls later on in for this football season, 1976, and then uh, Super Bowl in 1983. And they, they were, and 1980, how can I forget? They beat Philadelphia. So, I would say they were, if, if you're taking all the AFL teams, Oakland has probably been the most successful. And when I say that, I guess I have to call them the Raiders because they're in LA, Oakland, and out in Vegas. But Hadel, unfortunately, had to compete against those Raider teams. They did a pretty good job. And I, I think the committee, uh, especially, uh, should really consider Hadel because he was part of that AFL identity. And again, I'm going back to being a kid, and this is all romance. It's very romantic when I'm, I'm recounting all this, but I just remember watching those late football games on NBC. The Jets would be on the road in either Oakland, KC, and San Diego. And I remember a couple of games in San Diego because I was just absolutely fascinated and loved the Chargers uniform, and he would be their quarterback. And he won. Maybe not as much as. Other quarterbacks in the AFL, like Len Dawson, but he did win. And he did so much to uh, really promote the image of the AFL. So I hope they do think about that uh, in the future. All right, here's my next. I'll, I'll segue first to TCU and all things college football, and then I'll end the shows with baseball. But here's the take. All right, of the four, USC and TCU are turned upside down. Michigan, of course, winning really easily. Uh, I know it was a tight game first half with Purdue. Uh, it was 14-13 at half. But as soon as halftime ended, Michigan comes out and really bangs away with two scores and the game was over. Actually, when they went up by eight, I knew it was over. Uh, I, I really felt the only way Purdue was going to win was just get to an early lead. Like I was even thinking 14 points. I was even thinking 17, uh, miraculously, and then just hold off the Wolverines. It wasn't the B for Purdue. And um, so Georgia easily wins. TCU, of course, plays in the Classic. The USC game uh, was close. USC did not help themselves on Friday night, though. They were up 17-3 at one point. In fact, I turned the game off because I was rooting for Utah. Uh, then I turned it back on just to see how big the damage was. And I look, and Utah's ahead. Then they make it close again, USC, but then Utah comes right down. And the tight end, can't remember his name, 
just bulls his way right over. I mean, boom, they talk about him being a rugby player. Well, they showed some of the skill of being a rugby player. And then they, of course, USC came right down. I think they had a turnover on the interception on that next series. And that basically, you know, ended any hope for USC. They'll be back. Caleb Williams is an excellent quarterback. They got a great coach. I really didn't think USC was all that good this year. I know they destroyed Notre Dame last week, but Notre Dame wasn't really a good team. I'm not knocking USC. I just think they might have been there a year too soon. Who knows? And then, of course, TCU with Max Dugan, who may have done more with that loss yesterday to win the Heisman than in the previous 12 wins. Because yesterday, the nation saw uh, a number of things. And this is why I think TCU just may stay. I, I didn't think they were. I thought they were going to be one and done. That if they lost, they were out. But now it seems to be uh, that the consensus among many of these pundits and college football experts seems to be that TCU is going to get and keep the third spot. One being the reason was they played Kansas State again, who they had beaten in a come-from-behind uh, way. They have the best record. Well, they have the most wins of any of the top eight teams against top 20 teams. Number two, I, I said this last week. You now, they beat four teams in a row that were all in the top 20. They destroyed Oklahoma State season because after they beat Oklahoma State, they went in the gutter. Oklahoma State, they just tanked. They lost five of their last seven. They beat a tough K-State team. They had to pull out a miracle against Baylor even though they weren't ranked. I'm just saying they beat Oklahoma, longtime nemesis. Uh, and then they have to stage an unbelievable comeback against Baylor, a game I never thought they were going to win. And they, they boot uh, a field goal to win the game in the last seconds to, to maintain an unbeaten season. <laughs> Yesterday, what really happened was this. They had, they had stopped Kansas State. They had taken a lead. K-State got the lead. K-State got stopped on a fourth and short. And Max Dugan throws like a 40-yard pass. And Kid catches it great. Um, I, I don't remember the wide receiver, nor am I going to name him, even if I did. And he fumbled the ball. And right there, I got worried because I was rooting for TCU. Not that I'm a huge TCU fan, but I wanted them to break through. And I don't want this to be an all Big Ten SEC. They fumbled the ball, and they stopped them there. And I think had TCU scored, had they maintained possession there, they probably would have gone ahead and probably would have secured the game right there. As it was, it turns into a classic. I mean, if you weren't entertained by that game yesterday, back and forth, the drama, how many times teams were in a third and long and they would get the first down. And there was tough hitting in that game. Uh uh, there was some rugged hitting, tough hitting. I thought most of it was clean. And in fact, the referees proved that. And then on that fourth and inches. Now, many people say, if you can't get it over on fourth and inches, you should have. Uh, you might not deserve to go. But I think that the way Dugan played is probably going to carry TCU into that third spot. I think that the committee is going to choose TCU for a number of reasons. Even though the Heisman isn't decided until after the playoffs are set up, I think it would behoove the committee to take a Heisman Trophy winner. And I think Dugan might have done quite a bit uh, to maybe even win the Heisman from Caleb Williams, who seems to be, uh, he all of a sudden really turned in uh, a Heisman performance against Notre Dame, and that seemed to really propel him to the top spot. I think his loss against Utah might have hurt his spot or his shot this year. And I think Max Dugan, beaten up, exhausted, and rallying TCU from 11 down in the in the final seconds of that game to tie it and send it into OT, I think he might have uh, secured maybe a Heisman Trophy uh, award for himself. Uh, all right, so TCU, 
Now, here's the deal. There has been probably a push for Alabama. And of course, I am not privy to all that goes on, nor that I have all the stats that they're using. But remember this. Alabama was 3-2 and two against top 25 teams. They lost to Tennessee on the road, yes. But Tennessee got obliterated by South Carolina. And yes, South Carolina goes on and ends Clemson's hope of getting into the Final Four. And Alabama lost to LSU. See, here's where I'm thinking. Alabama lost to LSU in a game that, Yes, Brian Kelly goes for two points when he could have chosen overtime, and they were in Baton Rouge playing that game. But, you know, I was thinking about this. He had nothing to lose by going for two because they had already suffered two losses. So maybe in his mind they're not going um, to the Final Four. But by beating Alabama, he does put himself in that position. And he probably caught – Saban and Alabama off guard by going for the two points. All right. But here's the point. Did anyone feel LSU was in that game against Georgia? Probably the biggest point in the game, and I thought they should have taken the three. I think they're down, let's say, I think they were down 35-20. I was talking to my buddy on the phone when I watched, and they had like a fourth and one, and they got stopped. And I told my buddy, I thought they should have gone for three. Now, it's very easy for me to be. Monday night quarter, you know, the armchair quarterback and all the rest of it. But hear me out. Even though the three points, even though they need, uh, they were down, let's say 15, I think it was 35 20. Take the three, even though it was fourth and one. And the only reason I say that is because there were seven minutes to go in the third quarter and another quarter to go. They probably would have had another three possessions to get two scores and win the game. You get the three, all right? You're still going to need – my whole point was 35-20, okay, you're still going to need two scores, and you're hoping in both those scores that you can get two-point conversions. But if you got the three, then you can just get two normal touchdowns and win the game. Either way, you're going to really have to get three times up and down to beat Georgia. And, of course, Georgia stops them, and they just scored on that series after stopping them. And you could see the life come, the air come right out of LSU. And giving up 50 points, I have to be honest with you, I I think the committee is looking at that and saying, how good is Alabama? They lost them. They got two losses already. So it looks like Ohio State might just be back into. I'm not saying they're backing in, but it looks like they're going to be back in there. And I really do think that if TCU is ousted and they bring in a SEC team, I think you're going to see, if you have two SEC and two Big Tens, you're going to see quite a bit of criticism. So by having TCU, you have still a big Big 12 uh, team in there, a little bit more diverse. So it should be interesting. All right, let us move on. So here's mine. I still think TCU has a shot. Now, we have the passing of Gaylord Prairie, one of my favorite pitchers. (laughs) And I'm not a big fan of pitchers, but he is one of my favorites. And here it is. Will someone please remind Gaylord Perry that we outlawed the spitball up here as well? (laughs) First of all, I love Gaylord. He was Hall of Fame pitcher, winner of 314 games. As And I hope uh, I can make these big enough. Here's Gaylord as a Texas Ranger. (laughs) And, of course, here's Gaylord as a San Francisco Giant where he spent the first 10 years from 62 to 71 with the Giants. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. I also included Nolan Ryan because I have a little bit of stats here. And I have um, Justin Verlander. As I took this picture of Gaylord Prairie, winner of 314, 
in this picture, I knew he reminded me of somebody. Doesn't he remind you of a character actor from the old Superman shows? I love Lucy and all the rest of it. His name is Herb Vigrant. If he doesn't remind you of it, I, I, I don't know who does because uh, they look so much alike. Anyway, a little fun on that. Now, Gaylord, yes, known for throwing the spitball or with a foreign substance on the ball, yes. Was he a good pitcher? Yes, he was. Only got into one um, postseason, and that was with the 71 Giants. And then, of course, they traded him. He actually went one and one against the Pirates in the playoffs that year. And uh, Perry. Um, went one and one didn't have a good ERA. So what I was thinking and why I put Verlander along with Tom Seaver and Nolan Ryan in there is that I was talking to my buddy the other day and we were talking about who he would have on the mound. Would you take Nolan Ryan or Seaver, you know, and his contemporaries? And I've always maintained, I like Nolan Ryan, but I don't think, I know he won 300 games just like Perry and Seaver. And he lasted 20-some-odd years, 27 years. But if you are a baseball fan, would you start Game 7 of your World Series with Nolan Ryan, and I've mentioned this before, or contemporaries, Jim Palmer, Steve Carlton, Tom Seaver, Bob Gibson, Juan Marichal. I'll even go a little bit more, and Sandy Koufax. Would you go with them? Uh, I'm just trying to think. Man, I was just even looking. Mike Cuellar, who won 139 games in seven seasons with the Orioles when he came over from Houston. Just trying to think of some other great pitchers at the time. I mentioned Marichal, um, Catfish Hunter. Did he start over Catfish Hunter in a game seven. It's not a knock against Ryan. It's just that Everyone has always assumed that Ryan played for pitiful teams. In reality, I was I did the stats, and of course I can't find them right now as I'm going, but I did the stats between Ryan and Seaver. Now you can throw out the first four or five years because they were teammates on the Mets. Then Ryan is traded, of course, and uh, for Jim Fergosi. Interesting thing, even though Ryan played on some mediocre teams with the Angels. His winning percentage is not under 500. Do you realize that his winning percentage compared to Seavers is within two points? That is that Ryan's, the teams that Ryan played for were at like 503. And when I come back next year, I'll even, I'll have uh, the work in front of me. Actually, I might have it here. Yes, I do. Ready for this? Ryan's teams in his 27 years. All right. They were 503. Seavers was 506. Yet Seavers' winning percentage is close to 600. And Nolan Ryan's is about 525. So Ryan's winning percentage is about 20, 25 points over his team's winning percentage, while Seaver's is close to 100. Now you can say, well, Seaver was an elite. Okay. Well, here's Gaylord Curry. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you, he looks just like that character actor, Herb Vidron. I think it's Vidron or Vigron. Um, here is Gaylord Perry. And I did the stats because I was compiling it today and I used Justin Verlander and that's going to be a surprise. And, uh, also Sandy Koufax ready for this. I couldn't believe this. I had read an article where Gaylord apparently played for some mediocre teams, but not at the beginning when he was with the giants in his 11 years with the giants. For 10 years with the Giants, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, and it's 10 years with the Giants. The Giants 
were a plus 206 games over 500. Um, and actually, those giant teams, now they would finish second to the Dodgers many of the years, but they won over 90 games in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those years, including 62, the heart, uh, their only pennant. They won 103 games, 62 losses. There were 41 games over 500. Well, Perry pitched in 13 games that year. I didn't know where to go with that, but I, I'll tell you what. Even if I threw that 41 games out, the 13 games that Perry was in, and I don't know why this was. I thought maybe Perry came up late in the year, but it apparently was. He came up in, in, in April and was 3-1 and one, and then was not used for the rest of the year. And I don't know whether he was sent down or he was injured, but he was not on the postseason uh, roster. I know he did get a World Series share because all the players who uh, participate do get a share. That's not the important thing. But I'm going to even say this. If you throw those 40 games out, the Giants are 165 games over in nine years, which means that in nine years, 160 over, they're about 18 games over 500. Then he gets traded. Probably one of the worst moves the Giants actually ever made. I don't know why they made the move. Other than that, I know that McDowell, he gets traded for McDowell. McDowell was a big stud pitcher in the American League. Much like, same size, kind of like the same body, uh, the same kind of motion and everything else as Steve Carlton. Uh, 6'5", about 240, in the early 60s with the Indians. He was really good, won a number of, had 20-game seasons. I think he finished actually second in the Cy Young in 1970. Uh, led the league in strikeouts, like I said. Had some good ERAs. Pitched a ton of innings, all the rest of it. He goes to the Giants and really is the never, never the same player. Actually, though, uh, Gaylord goes over to the Indians and wins the Cy Young. But the team is 12 games under 500. Actually, Perry's like 24 and 16 or 23, 24 and 13. Makes the all star team. Um, and he had a 1.92 ERA. His season, though, is overshadowed by uh, Steve Carlton because Carlton wins the Triple Crown in the National League. Goes 27 wins on a team that only won 59 games. He had a sterling ERA under two. I think it was. Um, Maybe like one nine one led the league in strikeouts, threw a ton of innings. I'm pretty sure he probably led the league in innings pitched, but he won 27 games on a team that won only 59 games all year. Perry though wins 24. He actually wins one third of the Indians total. But then I was thinking, okay, then the Indians are 71 and 91, 77 and 85, uh, 79 and 80. In 75, but he gets traded to Texas, but that doesn't do him any good because both teams combined to be 13 games over 500 while he was with those teams. Basically, this he went from being on a team 206. Let's just say this he went from a team 165 games over 500 because I won't, I'll just discount 62. He was in there for 13 games. Let's just throw that one out. He goes from a, a team 160 games over 500 to teams that were 90 games under 500. Actually, 111 games under 500. <laughs> and he succeeds at a 551 winning percentage. Actually, if you take out uh, those 41 games, his overall team was 104 games over 500, over 20-some-odd years. So his teams were basically... 84 and 77. His 542 overall winning percentage records him at 87 wins. You know, Perry was a pretty good pitcher. He's 20 points over the winning percentage of the teams he played. And really, it's a higher winning percentage of the teams he played for when they were when they were, uh, he was actually a better pitcher for the lousy teams than he was for the Giants. But uh, 314 wins. Yes, always suspected of throwing the spitball, which of course is why I have uh, uh, the uh, cartoon on him. 
But he's one of those players, another character from baseball of the 60s, who was so exciting. Now, just to compare those three guys from the 60s, 70s, Ryan, Seaver, Perry, and I didn't do Gibson this time. Gibson, of course, one of my favorites. I used two guys to make this easier who have been relatively the same uh, with their team. Sandy Koufax, ready for this? Sandy Koufax only played for two teams that were under 500. The first year he comes up, uh, he comes up and I think he got into 10 games. And I'm just going to say this. When he arrives in Brooklyn, they were 49 and 16. Well, the Dodgers finish with 98 wins and 55 losses. Uh, the Dodgers are 49. And 39, 10 games over 500. But then, wow, he's on teams that would win one, two, three, four, five teams with those Dodgers would win over 90 games. Another two would win over 85. Basically this, he was, um, his Dodger teams compiled an 87 and 75 record. A 537 winning percentage. Koufax was at 655, his winning percentage. Over 120 points better than the Dodgers. Basically, this the Dodgers played to an 87 and 75 record in Koufax's years. Had Koufax and three other been, been like him or just had Koufax pitch every game? The Dodgers would have averaged 106 wins. Why do I say that? Well, I'm really starting to think how great a pitcher Verlander is. Ready for this? In his career, the um, teams that he's played on have been 12 games over 500. Verlander, though, has exceeded that. And if Verlander was your pitcher every game, you'd be averaging what the Astros did last year. You'd be getting also 106 wins. Very similar to Sandy Koufax. I just love doing all this. I hope you were able to follow along with all my little pieces and piece and, and statistics and, and kept it alive. I just want to wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, and we'll see you on the other side of January 1st, 2023. This is Willow Tool extending a shout out and a thank you to Howard for all that he does. Howard Fredericks produces the show. Thanks, everyone. See you in January.